Thank you and welcome. So with our bios, you probably realize that we're not really in the data analytics side of things. And um, we kind of stumbled onto this research topic of virtual reality. Um, it started with our students. So we, within our Masters of Athletic Training program and even in our undergraduate athletic training program, um, which we had previously, we required all of our students to do undergraduate research. Two of our students came to us and said, really interested in virtual reality. Um, this was two years ago. And uh, wanted to do something about whether or not training balance in a virtual reality uh, environment would have translated the same effects as, tr as balance when we're just standing here doing balance exercises. So very much an athletic training, rehabilitation performance. Uh, and this is where we started. So we had a small uh, little itty bitty goggles with an iPhone that barely worked. Um, sometimes did work, sometimes didn't work, who knows, and, and then, then free apps. Yeah, free, it was free, all the free marbles, and they, you know, made people sick sometimes. And then we had a balance, uh, uh, Biotex balance stabilometer where we'd measure the balance. So, as simple as you can, as you can get. Uh, and now, um, after we've realized how important and how uh, integral virtual reality could actually be to our setting of rehabilitation and prevention, and sport performance, which is really where um, this project is going. Uh, we have a sense arena, so I'll let Beth talk a little bit more about that. Um, so we started our journey with Sense Arena just this summer. Last year, within our master's program for our athletic training students, I gave them the options of what they can do research in, and we're trying to not let them do 85 different things because we are still only three people. It makes it hard if they go 85 routes. So we suggested virtual reality. In my mind, I'm picturing our cheap goggles, our free apps, and their cell phones. They looked at this. They wanted to look at helmeted sports and the impact of virtual reality in helmeted sports. Our hockey program was very successful at the time. They were doing very well. They went on to win the national championship last year. They looked at hockey and virtual reality and came to the Sensorino. And they brought it to me, their computer, and they said, look at this awesome system. And I said, that is awesome. Can we buy it? And I said, no, <laughs> can I buy it? Like I said, you could use free apps. That's how much money I have, zero. Um, I said, but I don't like to crush dreams. So why don't you reach out to the people associated with Sensorina and see if they're interested in any research. Um, our graduate student, Emily Miller, who is um, and John Cother are two graduate students working on this study, and they call it a happy Google. So they Googled it, they reached out to them. It was a couple weeks later that they finally heard back because of time differences and in different countries and all this stuff. And they said, yeah, we would really love to start research in the United States because all of our research currently is in Prague and we have no research started in the United States. Would you like to come? We're coming to Minnesota in two weeks. Would you like to come and visit us and see the system and, and start a relationship? So through that, happy Google and mine saying like, sure, I'm not crushing your dreams. I'm gonna let somebody else do it. Like I gotta be the nice professor. Um, thought they were going to get their dreams crushed, and now we have this beautiful system. Um, we have a working collaboration with Sensorina, um, which is a company out of Czech, the Czech Republic in Prague. Um, we are also doing some of our researches in correlation with Charles University in Prague. Um, so we have this relationship. I think if they would have known that we were a small Division three college, they maybe have said, like, oh, do you know anybody at a bigger school? And we would have said no. <laughs> what you got, right? They got to when we got there. They said, "How did you find out about us?" Like, oh, uh, we googled you. Like, that's all. Um, so again, now we're working with this more elaborate system. So you can see here, um, it uses the HTC Vive. If I'm not a techie, I can't. I will not pretend. It uses the HTC Vive software. Um, and then the Steam VR, and I think we're updated. We just updated last week, so it's like the 16 point something. I could look at it on the thing. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and then that computer that has the like trying of the diamond thing and some fancy computer with some fancy SD card or something in it. Um, and then their software. So it's their platform is Sensorina, which is a hockey sensor or a hockey virtual reality system. So into the current research, when we look at virtual reality, and Holly and I are researchers, so whether or not you asked us if we would ever be researchers. Um, we are currently researchers. We look back at the research in virtual reality. Some of the things that really strike out to me, if you look at a lot of the research, 
virtual reality and the way we're using it in an immersive environment with a wireless headset um, has really only been around for the last two years. So this is something that's relatively new. When we look back at performance in virtual reality and imaging, it really started in sports psychology with mental imagery and visualization. And now we're to the point where we can use a wireless headset with a stick in their hand. They can have pucks coming at them. They can have defensemen at them. There's a goalie. When they get really mad, they yell at the goalie a lot. They call him all bald and ugly. Yeah. Like he, you still didn't hurt his feelings. A lot of swearing. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of yelling at the people. But again, yeah. they're coming from veg visualizing a goalie in their head Is there to any actually. Virtual fights. No, not yet. <laughs> I've told them like you can check whoever you want. There's nobody there, so you just look like a fool. Get the ketchup bottle <laughs> and spray it across the room. Yeah. Um, so again, we've come really already in such a short period of time. The Sensorina was first launched in 2017, and at that time it was actually wired to the computer system, so they could only go so far. And now you just it's a battery pack and a headset um, plus the stick. So it's really come a long way, and they're actually and what we can find out there is really promising results in the literature. Absolutely. The other thing that's really interesting and like what from from Beth and my perspective like we're excited to partner with the data analytics group here on campus because we're really good at collecting the data. We're good at watching body mechanics. So we as athletic trainers we do a lot of hurry up and wait meaning we get to the practice we get to the game and we sit there and we wait for somebody to get injured. That doesn't really happen in any other medical profession. So what we do is we watch, and we become a steward of the game, really, and, or a steward of whatever activity you're watching. So you see when a baseball player, so like this article with Gray, is talking about how they're looking at the field of vision for a baseball player, and how really before the ball gets about five feet before you, the vision changes from the ball to the, the brain can't handle that that much overload in terms of all of the things that are coming into the ball actually somewhat disappears within their field of vision. So in virtual reality, that's what happens. They can take the ball away as it's coming in five feet before they hit it. So then when you're hitting the ball, you're actually not looking at it. So it's very realistic. We can, what we watch with people, what we watch with our players, we can see like, you know, they're having a really hard time moving this way or their knees fall in and what that comes back to is what we use a lot is haptic feedback, right? So feedback that's tactile, that's touch it, that you can touch. Well, the cool thing about the sensory now is that the stick buzzes. So they can't recreate the weight of the puck. That's the one thing that they're, that work they're, that they're working on. And Bob, the CEO, is like, don't always bring up our faults. <laughs> but it's not really the fault. It's just so at least the, the stick buzzes so that you can get that feedback of that there is actually a stick on your puck. Um, same thing with the baseball study. The more realistic you can make it, where the ball it actually buzz the bat will buzz when it feels like the ball is actually going to hit the bat. So you're not really, really being able to recreate that weight. Um, so what we're excited about is being able to think about all of the things that we have seen over the years in terms of why do people maybe get concussions when they get blindsided out of nowhere, and how can virtual reality help us in terms of increasing pe people's peripheral vision. Can we anticipate things more? So we're kind of jumping ahead to what our future research might be. But the other thing that comes out of a lot of the studies is the idea of near transfer and far transfer, meaning using virtual reality can actually help with near transfer, meaning whatever skill you're practicing, that skill is automatically going to get better pretty much immediately. But what about far tra transfer? And that's where a lot of the data analytics comes in is, as we work with these hockey players on their pass precision, and Beth will tell you guys a little bit more about what this system can all measure, how does that translate to the ice? So when we start to go look at film from last year to this year, can our forwards pass faster and more accurately based off of the training that they did on the virtual reality? Um, so the two things that come out with virtual reality is that virtual reality from a practice standpoint, from a sports performance standpoint, is that one, you can create perfect practice. Okay? So as a coach, you have 12 kids in front of you. All of those 12 kids need to get better at passing in general. But what is it about passing that they need to get better at? Is it how fast that they release the puck? Is it how fast that they can recognize who to pass to? Um, virtual reality can do that for us in terms of looking at the data. And then those repetitions on a virtual reality system can actually create perfect practice for these individuals, which is pretty amazing. Okay. There's no way for us to really know that by just standing there and watching. So you can create perfect practice, and you create what's 
create what's called evidence-based practice, um, really using what you can look at in the data and what we can analyze to create these programs essentially for people. So it's called adaptive, I'm sure you guys know that, the adaptive virtual reality, where it's adapting to what your player needs versus just putting everybody within the same system. This was just um, within the research also, they have a recent SWOT analysis. I just like this because I just gave students a bunch of SWOT assignments. So I was like, yeah, see, it's realistic. People are doing this. And it's just really nice because it does acknowledge that there are strengths and weaknesses. There are still threats. This is not a perfect system. There is no way that we can prevent all injuries. Because if Holly and I figure out that way, we are going to go live on an island somewhere and not have to work another day in our life, right, if we can prevent all injuries. So there are some weaknesses and there are ways that we're going to still try to grow and develop. But realistically, the opportunities we have with virtual reality are really promising. So when we look at our research and what Sensorina really was marketing towards is the brain training. So um, we have a quote from Bob, the creator at the end. but really when they talk about hockey sense, so it's just having it um, or not having it. And they're talking about when can that be developed? When does it stop being developed? Um, so hockey sense, again, being a step ahead of the play, anticipating, they talk about finding like the athletic gene and there is no athletic gene, right? It's about learning. So was Wayne Gretzky born a great hockey player or did he become a great hockey player through repetition? And that's really what that hockey sense is. So Dr. Parrick, who is the main researcher with Sensorina, found that hockey, they're defining hockey sense as five cognitive skills and six game skills that are interrelated. And then through training those specific 11 skills, we can develop our hockey sense. And that's where they came with Sense Arena. So these are the skills that they are looking at. Um, and I even have this as like my background because I'm trying to memorize them. They're just not in my head yet, right? So when we look at it, the game skills that we're thinking about are the release time, precision, looking for open lanes within their, their sport, spatial orientation, creativity, and verbal communication. And then the cognitive skills that it's measuring is reaction time, peripheral vision, multiple object tracking, detail recognition, and time movement anticipation. And the thing that's really integral about having that hockey sense is that those are all interrelated. So as we work on looking for open lanes, we're also working on our, our recognition time. We're looking at multiple object tracking and we're looking at time movement anticipation. So every drill within the sense arena is geared towards one of these skills through a combination of maybe working on recognition time and multiple object tracking to look for the open lanes. So that's what it's measuring within the system. The one thing that um, sense arena was very interested in partnering with us was because of the age group of hockey players that we have. So there's a theory talking about the hockey sense that at a certain age you really can't, it's, you're hardwired, that you really can't change your cognitive ability in terms of how you perform in a sport. Um, and even if you ask one of our coaches down here who are, it's a, a person in town who his sons are both very, very successful hockey players, he's like, you can't change their hockey sense. It, it's, it, they already know it. He's actually changed his mind <laughs> through his sons because his sons actually got on the system and they're like, that's amazing. Um, so it's, um, that's why they really wanted this age group that, we're, that we have here for the collegiate ho hockey players because um, most of the research that they've done so far on the hockey sense and the cognitive sides of things is really in younger people. Um, so can we truly change how people are thinking about it in older, older athletes? When I say older, they're young compared to me, <laughs> but older. <laughs> Um, again, the sensory and other research out there with this system is very limited. So it has, its second study is in publication now, so we don't have any results from it. But both studies have been done in Prague, and both studies have been done with youth athletics. Um, so they've done a lot of baseline testing, but no research testing. The one test that they have, that they have published, is on U10 and U12 hockey players in Prague. Um, what it did find was that it helps focus on the cognitive process and the hockey-specific activities and that it was able to increase their hockey sense. Um, but again, they had, I think, 12, 16 subjects, so it was a very small study, very limited data. So this is really, again, one of the push to bring it here and to get more research that we can put more out there. They use a similar research methodology as we did, which um, where we did baseline testing in the VR system and then a baseline testing on on-ice skills. So we had specific drills on the ice so that we can see 
um, transfer of the training and see if it actually impacts on ice performance. Go ahead, as well. We can come to that. So again, what we are doing for our research, and we are currently in the training stage, we did the sensory and a diagnostic test, which every player um, went through. So we have 30 hockey players, 15 men, 15 women, um, that participated are participating in this research study. All 30 of them did the diagnostic test. That was five virtual reality drills. They did each of them twice. Each drill in the virtual reality system is 90 seconds, and then it scores them it'll give them a readout like this that gives them their actual cognitive skills and the game skills. It gives them the percentages of passes made. So if it's a 76% precision, that's how much of the passes that they made to the correct person. Um, there's drills in there that they have to call for the puck. Um, they have to figure out if they talk to themselves, it thinks they're calling for the puck. Um, so they have to call for the puck. It'll recognize at times how long it takes for the puck to appear and for them to call for the puck. So like a stick turns green, then you have to call for it. It measures how long it takes you, how quickly. If you don't call for the puck, you don't get the puck, right? So I have to tell them, like, if you don't call for it, you just sit there with a the headset on. Um, you don't you'll get see, to do anything you'll else. You'll see a slide later yeah. one of our guys that you know doesn't verbally communicate. He always hits the stick on the ice. So that he gets really angry in the drill, and his verbal communication score is yeah. terrible. Um, and then, again, it, it gives them this picture representation of how they compare to the overall best in their age group. So it's grouped by age, so it's U10 through pro. All of our participants are in the pro level, so they don't have college, because in Prague they don't really have a difference between junior hockey and then pro. So it's U20 to pro. I compete at the U10 level, I'm pretty good. I'm like 10th in the country for U10. <laughs> so um, my stuff is a lot slower and easier for me. And then it also com uh, can compare them to the overall average, and then you can actually, and I'll show you later, benchmark it to other teammates, so you can look at their strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Within the diagnostic test also, it gives them their strengths and their areas for development. So those are specific for each individual player. So once they're done with their diagnostic report, and then for our 11-week training session, they were assigned a training program based on their results. So they each have their own 11-week training program. So we're on week four, we just finished week four, so they've done 12 training sessions and they are all different. I see a lot of overlaps and they'll see some drills, but they'll be in different orders. Each of them are geared towards them, so their pass speed increases, the accuracy of the pass decreases as they go on, so it continually adapts and changes, so it's always challenging them. Additionally, for our baseline testing, we did on-ice testing drills. Um, so when I got this, again, I don't play hockey. When I got this, I said, I don't know, I don't know what that is. That's a lot of scribbles. On and it wasn't Czech. Yeah, and there was no English with it in the words. Um, so I couldn't translate it. They translated it for me. I took it to our hockey coach, and she's like, oh, yeah, you're, so that's that. I'm like, okay, good. We did have two researchers from Prague come here and help us with the on-ice testing because they had done it in Prague first, so they piloted it in Prague, and then we adapted these tests and we created these tests. So they all did these four on-ice testing drills. Now the experimental group is in their 11 weeks of training. The control group, we are not altering their training, so they're continuing with their regular athletic training. So they're in pre-season, not season practice lifting. Um, then they'll start practice on October 14th, I believe, and we'll continue training through the end, through Thanksgiving. They were, they picked Thanksgiving like day for us to end. I was like, well, that's an American holiday. And they said, oh yeah, do the next week then. So we're going through Thanksgiving. Um, what we measure then in each of these drills, and I just quickly clipped out all of these from all of their training summaries. These are all the different things that it measures. So each drill will give them feedback and results on one of these or three of these on average um, on these drills. I have, oh, I have, so when each drill, when they get done, it gives them their spatial orientation. It gives them their release time in milliseconds. It gives them what their percentage of for peripheral vision. The only test that, or only um, of the 11 skills that cannot be measured on the ice or was not measured was the peripheral vision. Otherwise, the drills were aimed to get all of those core skills that they identified as hockey sense. Uh, let's see if I can go back now. Show the middle one. This is just some examples of what they look like. <laughs> so most of our Don't participants get in the way. do it in shoes. A couple of them do it on skates. Um, they think it's more natural. A lot of them just don't want to put their skates back on. Uh, 
So you can see too, like there's some agility ones, they actually have to move back and forth and um, they don't like to do this one because they have to run if they're in shoes and it's a workout for them. But so again, you can kind of see what it looks like in that, what they're actually doing. You hear that noise all the time if you come into our building. <laughs> I always know it's working yeah. when they do that. And then these are just some examples, because we are running short on time, of what they actually see. So each drill they get, they watch this video. The avatars look like this in the VR. So they are not real people, they are avatars. They get around, but they like, sometimes the defense people get right to them. The screen will turn red because they'll step into the defenseman. Um, so they get really into their spot. Um, this is one that they have to recognize when there's a certain amount of participants out there. So if there's a certain, like, five red jerseys, then they call for the puck. Once they get the puck, then they pass it to the person whose stick turned green. So again, it's multiple object recognition, it's reaction time, and then it's precision of passing and recognizing who you have to pass it to. Along with that, there's also a series of cognitive skill sets that they do. These are using paddles, so they come with the HTC Vive system. So it's on reflexing, multitasking. Fall one shape and one color shown on the map and touch them inside of the grid. You are executing these two tasks at the same time. So again, this is divided attention, multitasking that it's measuring. So they have to do both squares and blue, um, or diamonds and yellow. And sometimes they have to step back. There's one they have to just go and get pucks for 90 seconds, and they try to get the best. Each At the end of each one, it gives them their score, um, their overall score on the team. So that's all of our UWSP research participants, and their score overall for all of the people in the country or the world that are using the sense arena in the pro division. So it compares them. So they like, again, it helps some of that competitiveness too. They like to try to beat records. And, um, again, so and each, guys. Yeah, so they like to, this gives them at the end of each drill, they can look at what it was measuring and how they're doing. They get frustrated this week. They were really frustrated because it went up in um, difficulty this week. So then they're like, they're passing it so fast. And I was like, they're supposed to. Like the, the speed went up in there. Like it was automatically set to go up at the halfway point. So now they're getting faster picture, or sorry, faster um, <laughs> Multitasking. speed. Yeah, and the accuracy went down. So they're like, he's not passing it to me. Like, yeah, because you're supposed to move. Right? The whole point of it being this wireless system is they don't stand in one spot. There's actually a gray box on there, and if they get their stick out of the gray box, I haven't had anybody get them out of the gray box yet, then it turns red so they know they're getting close. I have had sticks hit the wall. Um, quite a few sticks hit the yeah. wall. No people have hit the wall. We had to get rid yet. of our projector. Because yeah, we did get rid of that, wow. and I sometimes have to yell, stay in your box, because they get all up and they want to get as close to the goal, and it's like, yeah, but now you're like two inches from the wall. Like, back up, get in the middle of your box. So, again, they are able to move, and they want them to move and call for the pass and get the pass in a good position. If they don't move, like a defenseman is right in front of them, and they call for the pass, they won't pass it to them because they're not open. Um, so again, it's really realistic. It makes them make those decisions in real time. Again, one of the other nice things on in this system is that it has this training benchmarks. Um, it also has the training plan development option. So a coach could go in and see. They can't right now because it's part of our research, so they can't do anything with it yet. So but they could see. We were talking about before. Yeah, that's the get the stick on the ice guy versus. Call yep. the puck. So his score is really, really low in terms of verbal communication. Yep. So you could see, you could benchmark players and say, okay, well, you have really good verbal communication, you're kind of lacking. Maybe we'll put you as D partners so that you can kind of make up for your each other's strengths and weaknesses. So teams could, lines could be made that way, D partners could be made that way. The other thing is that a coach can actually go in and they can develop a training plan. So if a participant misses practice, they could say, I want you to do these six drills and they'd have to go into the sensory and it can really develop what they need to work on. If they were working on a lot of power play stuff, if they are working on a lot of um, shooting stuff, then they can pick those drills for them. So if they had to miss anything, they could get in there and do that. And we have like two minutes for yeah. future applications. <laughs> do you have any questions before? I mean, future applications, are we're just scratching the surface here. And, and we, Beth and I are very focused really here on this injury prevention piece of it and how we can utilize some of the data that we're getting to say like, how could we actually help people prevent injuries especially from the concussion aspect of things because it is so 
prevalent within the research and so important for our athletes to be able to prevent injuries to their brain, obviously. Uh, and that's it. the safe return to play is also something that we're very interested in in terms of so someone's injured and they cannot get back on the ice, cannot get back on the field because of a physical injury. Well, we can put them in those cognitive drills and have them sit on a chair and they can still do the reaction time. They could still do some of the stick handling, maybe, maybe not. It just depends on the drills that we would pick for them. But we keep them in the game. So then once they get back on the ice from their physical injury, the cognitive applications, the perception, the motor patterns, everything that's necessary to be successful in their sport never really went away, okay? Plus the fear of injury, the fear of re-injury. If you're afraid of being injured because you, somebody's gonna be coming at you or you're afraid of turning and pivoting because your knee's gonna be injured, let's do it virtually where nobody's around you. It seems like there's somebody around you, it's an avatar. Your screen's gonna turn red, but no one's gonna be smacking you from the left or from the right. So that safe return to sport, even from a concussion aspect, so let's, put some, let's put some heart rate monitors on people at the same time that we have them in a virtual real, reality setting and see what their stress level is when it's in terms of return to play. So there, there's so many applications that we could go left, right, center, all over the place in terms Just of the application. Just analyze our data. Yeah. So we'll be calling you. Um, but if we would like to open up for questions, obviously, before we go more into detail, if you guys have anything. And I'll just up here, um, this is the founder and the, of uh, Sensorina, and he did tell us we could share his contact information. So that is his US phone number. Again, yeah, just remember, time he's in Prague, so <laughs> don't call him in the middle of our evening days overnight there um, and his email he's very responsive to email that's probably the easiest way because of the time difference we do some whatsapp and we have our ways of chatting with him quite frequently but he's a uh, very happy my eight-year-old is doing good <laughs> go ahead thank you so the 11 things that make up uh, hockey skills are those conventional hockey wisdom or how did you uh, stumble upon like all right these are the specific 11 things that will have the biggest impact was that through a previous study or how did you come to the, no, the individual that came up with that is dr thomas parish 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 he's out of uh, uh, charles university in prague he his expertise is actually sport development for children um, and he does a lot of sport analytics with um, the youth population in the Czech and tries to put them through this programming to try to figure out what sport that they'd actually be successful at, like where their skills are in terms of a certain skill set. Yes, you're going to be good at hockey. Yes, you'll be good at basketball. I don't think they have baseball there. I'm not sure. But so this was developed based off of him um, and his, his theory in terms of what the sport of hockey would do. Um, the other investors that are that helped with this are there's NHL players on there. Um, there's a neuroscience um, professor as well. So I think it's a collaboration of what they thought hockey sense was. If you look up the definition of hockey sense, it's different everywhere. Um, game sense, hockey sense. You know, I mean, there's just personal definitions of it. Um, so this was just the definition that was created to help create the software. Um, to be have to, to have measurable variables. Yeah. yeah. How did the players react to using it? Did they think it was useful? Were they kind of like? They're, so far, they like it. They get grumpy. I'm not gonna lie. Sometimes because they miss shots and they don't score goals that should have been. And they can hear it hit the pipe. They can hear it hit the goalie's pads. They can hear other people calling for it. So they get sometimes frustrated, but they like it. I've had. It'll be interesting once practice has actually starts. So right now they're in conditioning and whatever. Um, they have some open skates that they do, and I've had a couple of players come back and say, like, yeah, I scored three goals today based off of the drills that I did. Like, it's just helping them recognize things differently. But that's what we're really curious to see now once they get in, because half of each team is in the study. Uh, well, most of the team is in the study, but only half of them are doing the VR training. The other half is irritated <laughs> that they didn't get picked for yeah. an experimental group. The goalies are really mad right now, but in 2020, Sensorina is coming out with a goalie platform, so we're hopeful for them. Um, so again, they so far it's been really good feedback. Sometimes they get frustrated in the moments, but once they're like, it's their competitiveness, and they don't score goals or they don't set the championship record, then they get grump, grumpy. But they like it. In general. Is anybody doing this in that at NHL? They're doing, I don't know if they're collecting the same type of data they're in the NHL. Research, they're not doing research. They're using it. Uh, the Capitals has it. Uh, the Knights Vegas, uh, yeah. Vegas has it. Um, what they have said more so from um, the higher level players is that 
and where they can put the system. So they have the system right within their locker room, and they use it before the game to get game ready. So actually Tyler, one of the guys that came and installed the system, he plays recreational, um, and he so he'll use it before he goes out onto a, a recreational game. Um, anybody that's played hockey before says it takes about three to four shifts to kind of get into the game, because if you watch a hockey warm-up, it's social. It's very social. It's, I mean, we've seen a million of them. They're shooting water. They're shooting pucks at us, at, at, at the athletic trainers, and shooting water bottles everywhere. It's not necessarily cognitive. The cognitive warm-up that they get, they feel that they are ready to go for the game immediately. Tyler said he almost feels like if he didn't do it before the game, he almost felt like he was hungover, was his word, that he just didn't feel like he was into it. So that was, that's how they're utilizing it more at the higher level, is to get the cognition in the game ready beforehand. But they're not doing the research part side of it. Um, oh, we're out of time. Yeah. How about a round of applause? Again, Holly and I traveled from very far this morning over in the new Champions Hall, <laughs> formerly known as the Hack. So if you need to get a hold of us, we are here. Yeah. If anybody wants to come and see the system, contact us and let us know. We're more than happy to Thank you so much. show it off. Thank you. Just leave it running. Okay.